Bitcoin is surging. Gold is not giving up ground. Stocks just had their best quarter in decades. And today's guest, Mr. Peak Prosperity, Chris Martinson, is about to go down the rabbit hole and discuss many of these matters, as well as America's most pressing problems, unfunded liabilities, and the need to finance them with debt the world doesn't want to lend Washington any longer. Get all of this incredible research at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Chris. Go there now. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are excited to be launching our April interview series with a fantastic guest here today to discuss the top stories that are in the news right now. Before we get started, just a note to mention some of our top interview releases so far this year. They include David Stockman, Bob Moriarty, Charles Hugh Smith, Cynthia McKinney, Robert David Steele, and G. Edward Griffin. We just published our Mark Faber interview with his free report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Faber. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Dr. Chris Martinson. Chris is the co-founder of PeakProsperity.com. He is a brilliant economist, also a researcher that holds an MBA from Cornell and his PhD from Duke. Chris predicted the how housing crisis of 2008 and the stock market correction years in advance. We've created a free detailed report covering some of his most incredible insights. The link is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Chris, and we are excited to have him on the show today to get his opinions on many of the extraordinary things that are taking place right in front of our eyes right now. Chris, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Thanks. Oh, Michelle, it's a wonderful uh, time to be back with you here today and all your listeners. Yes, and it's going to be so interesting. This show, Chris, we want to start off right off the top with President Trump. The Mueller report has just come back with zero collusion after a very long, very expensive investigation. And it feels like the president's approval ratings are continuing to get better and better. From your perspective, what is next for the president in terms of China, the border wall, and other agenda items? What will be the president's strategy going forward? Well, I wish I could predict that. Uh, based on his, <laughs> on his tweets, I think his own advisors wish they could pick that, yes. you know, pick that out. He's, he's mercurial for sure. And, uh, and I think that was at least in part why the apparatus of Washington, D.C. worked so tirelessly to try and derail him. And uh, the, the Mueller report, I knew it was going to be a nothing burger unless they were going to manufacture something. They had years, no data got released, you know, a peak prosperity. It's all about the data. If they have data, they release data always. You know, it gets leaked, you get a peek at it. There was nothing. So I was very confident predicting all the way along it was a nothing burger. But oh my goodness, it wasn't nothing in terms of what it revealed about just how corrupt and how cliquish and how. Um, really disappointingly human <laughs> DC has become in so many ways. You know, this is a time we need really great leadership. There's extraordinary things happening. Not all of them good, right? And we need true leadership at this point. But you can't do that if everybody's just bickering over power and uh, evading responsibility. So uh, I, I truly think that Charlie Munger, the right-hand man of, of, of Warren Buffett, said it best. If you show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome right? The incentives in this story are that the people in DC do really awful stuff. They don't get in trouble for it. The bankers do really awful things. They don't get in trouble for it. Without that accountability, the incentives are there to lie, cheat, and steal. And that's what we've really got. So if I had a wish list, Trump would actually go after some of these players who've broken the laws, um, violated the oath and trust of their offices, and make them pay for it. That would be a great new turn of events in American politics, which we haven't had in a long time. So again, without the accountability, the incentives are wrong. With bad incentives, you get these bad outcomes. So uh, that's really where we are at a time when we need extraordinary leadership. You mentioned China. Michelle, they are coming on like gangbusters. If you visit, I know in this country, you know, in the United States where I live, we're fed a lot of sort of propaganda. You know, Chinese, they just copy stuff. They steal stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you go there, 
they have an amazing industrial new economy, well capitalized, high speed trains you can take from point A to point B, the world's only orbiting quantum satellite, which is an extraordinary piece of invention, which the United States doesn't have. They didn't copy that from anybody on and on. So they're really coming up fast, hard. They understand resources the same way that I do in terms of just how rare they are and how much more rare and how much the future is going to be defined by that rarity going forward. The United States is blundering along, uh, pretending that, you know, as long as we sell, you know, an extra thousand F-150s next quarter, we're good, right? You know, it, it's just, I really feel we're adrift a little bit at this point. What do you make of the fact that, going just back to the Mueller report right now, that the Democrats seem to actually not be accepting this and now finding something wrong with Mr. Mueller, who all along they were saying there's collusion, he's got it, it's taking so long, there's so much of this, we have proof, we have proof, we have proof. That's all we heard of a lot, you know, and, and so people were really starting, even Trump followers and fans and people who adore him were starting to think if this is taking two years and we're spending, you know, tens of millions of taxpayer dollars, there must be something here. And for them to come back with not only, well, there's a smidge of this or a smidge of that, zero, nothing. So should the shoe now go on the other foot? What are your thoughts about that? Should we investigate the Democrats? Well, I absolutely think that, that anytime there's obvious, so, so two things. One, the reality of the law is important, but also the appearance of the law. It, it doesn't, a society, any civilization begins to fray and ultimately falls apart if they, the powers that be, can just change the rules and the rules don't apply to them, and, but they apply really harshly to the little people. So we live in a society where you can find example after example where poor people spend years in jail for relatively minor offenses because that's the law. But when you're at the powerful levels, they do stuff um, that, that's really beyond the pale. So let me, let me be clear. There was a lot of collusion that happened in 2016, but it was the Democratic National Committee colluding to put Hillary in above Bernie Sanders. There's tons of evidence for that. Even Donna Brazil wrote an insider's book on that and said, yeah, tons of, tons of collusion. So in psychology, the art of projection is where you, you paint somebody with your own greatest weakness in order to make yourself feel better about yourself. So for the Democrats to have come out and said, oh, it's Russia, you know, uh, you know, they colluded. And that's why we lost the election. It was just it was in psychological terms. Couldn't be more obvious what happened here. Uh, they blew it. They blew it badly. They they put up somebody who was probably the least electable person they could possibly find. <laughs> and then instead of taking their lumps like adults and looking in the mirror and saying, wow, what did we do? How could we have done that better? What should we not have done? Maybe there's some house cleaning that needs to happen here. They didn't. They doubled down on the whole story and, and went forward. And Mueller was supposed to be their fixer. He's got a long reputation of being a fixer. That's what he does from his time as a prosecutor in Boston when he was mishandling the Whitey Bulger case on through his career is one long sort of story of fixing stuff for the system. And that again brings me back to my main point. If it looks rotten, smells rotten, tastes rotten, might be rotten, we have a really rotten system in DC. And I would support, yes, I would support anybody of power and consequence facing the actual reality and appearance of the law so that we at least, uh, you know, can, can tell ourselves that we are that shining hill on a city. We are the example. There's a reason people want to come and be part of the American dream because we're free and fair. That fair part's been missing in action for a while. Yes, and I'm not trying to sound harsh when I say the shoe should go on the other foot, but a lot of people are actually losing faith in our justice system. When we watch someone be investigated, and, and again, you know, half the country, more than half the country obviously voted for him. And, you know, we're sit, sitting back saying, what's really going on here? And for them to come back with zero after spending so much of our money and so much of our, our news media, you know, if you were, if it were me and the news media was covering me and saying that I'm a thief and I'm a traitor and I committed treason and I hear this over and over every single day and the entire country is watching this happen. Honestly, I'd start to question the loyalty of my country and the people watching it happen are starting to question our justice system and that's the truth. You know, whether they wanna face it or not or whether they wanna just, I hope this isn't just let go. Um, we have Lindsey Graham saying that he 
you know, is very much behind um, coming forward and, and investigating where the origin of this all started because it turned out if there's zero, absolutely nothing, which is hard to find. It's hard to find a person that has zero, <laughs> zero fault. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, uh, let's be clear. If the FBI investigates anybody for long enough, they're going to find you a foul of something, right? It, there's what are there? 27,000 pages of federal code right now. Many of them contradictory. You could be, you know, in compliance with this one and out of compliance with that one. I'm sure that I violated my end user license agreement with Apple. I must have, right? It's 700 pages long or whatever it is, right? There's probably something in there. So, so if you really dig at somebody long enough, you'll always find something. And it's astonishing. You know, the old standby, when the FBI doesn't have anything on you, they get you for lying to the FBI. But what they call lying to the FBI could simply be a misstatement or a misremembrance. So if somebody came to me and said, Chris, three years, four days, six hours ago, exactly what were you doing? And I'd be like, I don't know. They're like, well, you should have known you know, that's, that's a foul. So they, the, if, when the FBI gets you online, it means they didn't have anything else, right? right. Uh, but they have a, a, you know, and here's how they get people on that lying stuff. The person that has a choice. Well, look, this is a BS charge. I can fight it. That's probably going to cost me about a million bucks, right? You know, to really fight that charge. Or I accept their plea deal. You take the plea deal because it's a lot cheaper. It's just an adult rational process that a lot of people take. And the next thing you know, you know, the FBI says we have a 98% conviction rate, which means, you know, they're that good. Or people just don't want to go into the buzzsaw of going up against and, you know, deep pocketed federal prosecutors. It's, it's just a game that has to be played a lot. The thing that I think was most important, what you talked about, though, is it really, this is the part that gets me. I understand why this all happened politically. I understand politics well enough. I understand the Machiavellian point of view. I, I get it. I, I understand that that's how the world works and has worked for a long time. But what's at risk here as they try and score cheap political points is the is the belief and faith that people have in the larger system. If you erode that far enough, then you get something that goes by two words, civil war. We're already at an intellectual divide that's the largest in my adult life. I've already lost friends over things I don't understand because they're convinced that there's something there when I'm saying in this, this is my, this is, you know, I'm bad about this because this is what I do. I say, oh, really? What? You know, I want, I want the data like, oh, collusion. I'm like, Find me something called collusion in the criminal code. It, there's no such thing, right? So there, the, a crime has to be committed in, in some way, shape, or form. And, and for that, there has to be some sort of evidence or data. And this was a completely fact-free sort of journey that was uh, really operating in the sphere of narrative, not facts. They were creating that narrative. You mentioned if somebody, if the media is constantly saying, traitor, collusion, Putin puppet, blah, blah, blah. They say that often enough, it becomes real for people, as real as if they actually had facts. And we don't have those facts in this case. So I'm a fact-based person. If you show me facts, I'll change my mind, you know, but I didn't see any. They didn't release any. The ones they did release, I was like, that's not a fact. Remember, they had this, the, the one fact they tried to release, they said, oh, we chased, traced down the, the piece of the hacking software that we think was used to penetrate Podesta's emails to a server in Russia that's known to be used by the Soviet, by, sorry, by the Russian services. Like, dude, 13-year-olds know how to set up Tor servers and bounce their IP through a VPN, you know? Like, nobody leaves a digital trail back to the server in the motherland, you know? So they released that, and I said, oh, this is not even, this is not even a joke of data, like that they thought that anybody would believe them. And you go to like wired.com or talk to anybody who's in the, in the cyberspace at all. And they just, they roll their eyes like, Oh, that was, that was whoever, whatever intern at the FBI came up with that story needs to be repurposed to the mailroom because that wasn't a good one, you know? <laughs> yeah, they, they completely underestimate the technological knowledge of the American people or of the world today globally. I mean, it's yeah. like people who really don't have any knowledge technologically making up excuses for what's happening and then people yeah. that actually know what's viable and what could possibly happen, look at that and say, you know, what? And then, and then you have to like, because it's coming from the government as an entity, um, I kind of that kind of drives me crazy when people say, well, it's the government because I'm like, no, it's people. There are certain people doing this and putting it out. And if we can just get to the source, which is circling back to this, let's find the source of this. And when it actually started, we have a pretty good idea at the moment, but nobody comes back with zero anything except like 
a really good guy, <laughs> you know? So this is extraordinary. Staying with politics just for a moment, Chris, what do you think will be the biggest campaign promises and topics coming up for the 2020 election? What are your predictions? Oh, this is easy. Uh, so what's happened over the last four decades or so is that we've had this thing called neoliberal economics. And I'd love to believe that there's a difference between the parties. Anything I've ever said should not be construed as partisan anything. A pox on both their houses right now, as far as I'm concerned. Because what's happened is that everything that, that should have happened hasn't happened. And that is that, that people should, should have free and fair opportunities to exist. Here's what's happened. Um, jobs have been shipped overseas because of these neoliberal trade policies, Democrats and Republicans both saying that Trump was the first person on the campaign trail to actually speak to that and say, I care about the average worker. You know, you guys kind of got a raw deal and people are like, yes, first time we've heard that and it's true. So what we saw was these neoliberal policies all over the OECD. And what they do is they squeeze and just squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until there's nothing, there's no blood left in that turnip, you know? And, when you finally get too far, people revolt. They revolt at the polls in yellow vests in France. They were revolting in the streets. Brexit, they revolted at the polls. We're seeing it in Italy. How do we tie these together? Very simply, the economic pie is not growing anymore. The problem is, is that we have a system of laws and money, banking and, and regulations, that guarantee that money always acceleratingly quickly flows to the very top. So we look at that wealth gap, it's enormous, it's gigantic. Nobody in either party really knows how to deal with it, but they're great at making promises. So to your question, easy prediction to make. 2020 is all about different groups promising more of the loot to other groups, right? So, uh, you know, a populist is going to just really have a field day in the United States. The question is, what flavor is it? You know, I don't care what we call it, socialism, capitalism, communism, it doesn't matter. We don't actually have any of those isms right now. Uh, in operating in America. So somebody who comes along and says, I see the plight of the common person. I'm going to help you out here. I know you've been getting killed by healthcare, by a sick care system that's just growing out of control. We know that colleges and universities have been just killing you on tuition costs. So, you know, and that's part of the American dream. And that's sort of been really either taken away or made super painful with all the debt you have to go into uh, on and on and on and on. And, and, you know, there's no relief in this story. And somebody who offers relief is going to get a lot of traction in this. So I'm agnostic again. I don't care what we call it. Um, <laughs> but, but there's reasons, a deeper reasons people need to know about for why that pie has stopped growing. Too much debt is one. Promises that can't be fulfilled like on under and unfunded liabilities, pensions, things like that. But as well, the world doesn't have the same resources it used to have to support the rapid rates of growth of old. Yeah, there's a lot of shale oil there. It's also really expensive to get out of the ground, right? So this is the world we live in where fast growth is, a, is part of the rearview mirror. Unfortunately, we have an economic and a monetary system that is really, really good at, at an exponentially fast pace, making the wealth accumulate to the top. So without redistribution, without some way of enforcing it going away, I could build a spreadsheet for you and show you in like three minutes that if you run our type of debt-based money system long enough, eventually one entity owns everything and everybody owes them uh, via debt. That's just how the system works, right? So I'm not saying it's good or bad, but if you don't understand that that's a feature of the system, not a bug, and have some way of correcting that, then you're in deep trouble. The central banks have been just painfully ignorant of that. Davos this year, 1,500 jets. There are now five people who owe as much is half of the world's population. Follow that along far enough and eventually it's one owns everything. Obviously, we won't get there. There's revolts and things that happened before then. We're already seeing the ballot box revolts. Those are going to continue because we can't have an honest discussion about how the system is just structurally unfair. And if that's the case, how, not when, if, but how are we going to create some fairness in that system given that it's just got, it's structurally unfair. And that's the, that's the conversation we haven't had. Democrats, Republicans, none of them have done that. Um, they don't dare touch that story yet. That's an excellent point, though. Um, you know, I just had a, an amazing interview with Dr. Mark Faber, and um, 
He brought up the fact that what we're creating right now is akin to the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. We're creating a base, a huge number of very, very poor people. And the people at the top are just ignoring this, you know, ignoring this situation as if it's okay. And it's not. Because what you're creating are people that are very angry and, you know, the yellow vests that you mentioned. We have mm -hmm. AOC who's coming up with like, you know, her, but she came from a situation. Um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez came from a situation where she was, I, I don't know this for a fact. I'm hearing what I understand her to say is that she's very poor and she represents the poor echelon of people. But the fact of the matter is even the numbers show that we have a huge wealth gap. We have a huge discrepancy. And as you just mentioned, it can only get worse until we address it. That's absolutely correct. And so just to, you know, just to put a, a simple example, let's imagine the Walton family owns a hundred billion. They can't possibly spend more than a billion of that a year. That's 1%. But they put it into treasury bonds yielding, let's just make around number 3%. Well, where did that other 2% come from, right? So that's going to be some ridiculous amount. That's, that's like 20 billion a year at 2% is like just flowing towards them and they can't even spend it that fast. So next year, it's just a little bit bigger and they get 2% of that. And then you, and it just eventually just goes, it makes that hockey stick. And eventually, if you don't have a means of, of redistributing that, it all ends up in one spot. Again, feature of the system, not a bug. Uh, and of course, the powers that be have always liked it that way. And, and, and that's what the central banks are busy defending. But the villains in this story never get talked about. The United States Federal Reserve is the single institution most responsible for that wealth gap. They knew they were going to create it. They created it. But then they just kind of go, not our problem if the people revolt. You know, it's like, no, you guys, if you're in charge of the steering wheel and the car goes over a cliff, that's kind of on you, you know. And so they've been given great power, but almost no oversight. And nobody in the press or in the Humphrey Hawkins testimony asks them the right question. So if I had a chance for Jerome Powell, 60 minutes, oh, I was inflation. Get off of that, Scott. Let's ask the real questions. Jerome. We already have the largest wealth gap in all of history. The Federal Reserve is the proud owner of that gap. Now, tell us, how far are you willing to let that go? Is it when 10% of the country owns 90% of the country? Or is it when 1% of the country owns 100%? There's a number in there. Tell us where it is, because we'd like to know, right? That would have been a good, hard question. He would have blah, 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 you know, <laughs> been unable to answer it. But it's what's <laughs> happening, right? Meanwhile, we have a press that just can't get out of its way chasing fantasies. And that's like the reason I'm offended by the whole Russiagate thing. It was a nothing burger, a distracting nothing burger at a time when critical things are happening that really deserve our highest attention. None of that stuff got talked about. It's very interesting, the coincidental timing, isn't it, that this, this is coming to a head? The mm -hmm. Federal Reserve has created a massive true problem that's going to create a revolt literally throughout the world. And then we have a two-year investigation against the United States president who is talking about it. He's talking about it. He's saying, you know, he's, he is saying the Federal Reserve is a problem. And um, they come back with, well, Russian collusion. And no one, no one, do you think, Chris, that it's possible that the journalists of our country don't know that this problem exists, that they don't see it happening? Because it seems to me that they would be on it as a journalist. You know, this is the top you know, problem. We've got a, a huge revolution coming up. We've got a massive amount of poor people. We've got an off with their heads kind of mentality, which is leading to the socialism movement. Um, what do you think? Do you think it's possible they just don't see it? It's possible. You know, a lot of people who are, who are sort of, you know, stuck in the matrix can't really detect the matrix. They are the proverbial fish in the fish tank, unaware of the water, you know. Um, but as well, there's a, a thing going on, which is what I call public and private conversations. In private, I'll bet you a lot of these journalists see it. But publicly, well, they've got a job to keep. They've got editors who are, who are pushing a, an agenda. Um, so it's really difficult to figure out, you know, what's real in this story in terms of what journalists really think. So I wouldn't want to ascribe their intent, but I will tell you that within the profession of journalism, they're definitely stuck in a very narrow Overton window. So Overton was a, a uh, diplomat a while ago who described a process that said, here's the range of, of what's considered polite conversation. So we're allowed to discuss all the ways 
Trump may or may not have colluded with Russia. But what's not in the Overton window is raising the question of saying, maybe this isn't a real thing at all, right? You're not, that's outside of the window of polite conversation. So you can't have the conversation. The United States is Overton window is this little tiny box, you know, where we can't talk about stuff that, that's really important. And so here's, a, here's an example. Describe, you know, however you, however you want to talk about how this is actually happening. 100% of what I know about the yellow vest, I have to go to my Twitter feed. I've got a bunch of people I follow. I've got some keywords and the hashtags that I follow. And because of that, and because I'm proactive, I know what's happening. I've only seen one round of, of journalistic sort of inquiry into the yellow vest. It happened three weeks ago, and it came out all of a sudden, and it was suddenly in the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, it was everywhere, right, where they discussed uh, the rise of anti-Semitism and the uh, use of conspiracy ideation and its, its entrenchment in the yellow vest movement. Like suddenly all three newspapers are like, oh, look, there are anti-Semites who are conspiracy theorists. You know, I was like, that's really weird. You know, how, how odd that three newspapers that really dominate the conversation all had the same remarkable conclusion, right? And it's clear they're not covering it. This is one of the most exciting things from a news standpoint. There's, there's intrigue, there's violence, there's blood, there's excitement, there's drama. There's, it's really important and none of it. I mean, if any of your listeners now are going yellow vests, the, most of the people in the audiences I talk to and I poll, I say, how many people are familiar, deeply familiar with the yellow vest? And some of them haven't even heard of it, right? These are normal media consumers, so we're not talking about it. So the question is, how does that not get talked about? Well, it's outside of the Overton window. And the reason is the, the, the true reason for the yellow vest has nothing to do with conspiracy theories, aliens, or, or anti-Semitism. It's the people are saying, the government has gone too far. They no longer serve our interests, and we are no longer okay with that. Well, the powers that be definitely don't want that thought process, you know, jumping the channel and ending up in the UK or over here in the United States. They don't want people finally asking that question, which is, how screwed have we been and what can we do about it? That's what the Yellow Vest movement is about. So, how does it happen then? This is the right question. How does it happen that such interesting um, headline leading news? is kept completely out of the United States and most of, most of Europe's airwaves. I don't know. But how, how, you know. Is it that all the journalists suddenly decided, yeah, you know, all that action is too much. We wouldn't want to cover that, you know. Oh, look, there's a oh, high boy. school kid. High school kid standing there smiling as a Native American guy beats a drum in his face. That's, that's news. You know, got to run with that. Like, it's just when you watch what does and what does not get reported, I consider them two sins of the media right now. One is a sin of commission where they fabricate stuff. That happened with Nick Coving, with, with that Nick, um, uh, what's his name from Covington Nick, High? Um, yeah, from Covington Catholic. Sanderman. Sandman. 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 That's it. Yeah. So, so they, that's a sin of commission where they overtly, you know, just man, man, manufacture stuff, lie about it. And then there's the sins of omission where they just don't tell you about stuff, right? The yellow vest falls into that camp, right? And I, I'm, I understand why they don't want to talk about it, but it, it just confirms for me that, you know, a nation without the ability to have the right conversations, have access to the true data, spending its time chasing its tail on false stuff is just a nation that's, that's really not going anywhere good fast. Right. And the news is someplace we go. I mean, you, yeah, I think you're absolutely right in that they can only cover what they're allowed to cover because if they're going to cover something else, they're not going to have a job. Right. And that's the bottom line. You know, people, you know, say, you know, well, the reporter, that reporter, they're asking this. So when I say the journalist or the news, I really mean the companies themselves. But, but I think you're right. They want to control the narrative and they want you focused upon this terrible you know, Christian kid that within this mega hat made fun of this Native American who the Native American turns out to be, you know, not, not so clean himself, you know what I mean? Seems to have caused the incident and it wasn't even looked at in these poor boys, you know, and so they're then the, the, the school's talking about kicking them out and the school's got to have security and, and they're ashamed of them. I think the school when they originally, the story originally came out, the heads of the school talked about how ashamed they were of these mm -hmm. boys. And that, when you're a kid and, you know, you're trying to do the right thing, that to take a child and to use him that way 
by the media, which is what I thought, you know, which was what I felt happened was to use him to make a, some kind of statement against Christians, maybe, or um, it's interesting, President Trump's attorney is a graduate from that school. And you know what I mean? It all circles yeah. back. You know, that yeah. was a very this, interesting nugget. This is a, this is a fun one to unpack. Um, and I was front lines on this one. So, so I, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, Davos is happening at this point time, right? The World Economic Forum. So I'm thinking this is what people ought to be focused on, right? There's some really powerful people getting together, basically saying, you know, all the central bankers go there and and they're all, this is something you need to follow because you get to find out, you know, a lot about what's happening in the world. Some important stuff was coming up there. So I'm trying to get some attention on that. And then I think this, the Covington High thing happened on a Friday. So Saturday morning, my Twitter feed's just alive with it. I watched this doctored video that now, you know, everybody knew was doctored, but I looked at it and I said, well, that's not the complete story. And I immediately went over to YouTube and found two longer versions of it that were like an hour long. And I sort of scrolled through and, and went up enough to say, wait a minute. I saw this Native American guy walk all the way over and I saw what happened. There was all this context. There's these black Israelite guys doing, who are like really the, 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 the dark actors in this story, the ones who are really, you know, I, I think deserving of a lot of criticism, whatever. And I what had the whole thing to them. What happened nothing, to the radical Israelites? Nothing. I mean, when you know, people so, were to see what they were shouting at those children, you know, you're murderers, you know, you're going to, you're going to shoot up your school and the one African American child in the crowd with his white friends, mm -hmm. they were shouting horrible things at this child. Yeah. So it's, it's not, it's got nothing to do with, you know, Oh, we're against whites. They were just attacking everyone. That little American, well, African American child, the little boy turned away. It looked to me like he was crying and his, his friends were surrounding him kind of, kind of came in to circle him against these Israelites. So why, why was nothing said about that? What happened there? I don't know. It's, 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 you know, again, it's, it's, it's the narrative that they want to paint that, that lands them in the window, anything outside of the window, they don't know what to do with. We saw this in 2016 election cycle. I was personally offended by this. So I follow the news really closely. I have a lot of information at my fingertips, but this should be a journalist job. I'm not a journalist, right? I knew how to go to YouTube and look at the longer form. It was, it was not, it was three days later. I found that out within literally within minutes and it took the media three days to catch up to that for reasons that are mysterious to me, right? But think back to the 2016 election cycle. The media was all offended by all the stuff that Trump said. Great, it's offensive stuff. But here's how many articles I remember reading about the fact that Hillary Clinton's husband, Bill Clinton, took 26 separate logged trips on Jeffrey Epstein, the pedophile, 26 separate trips on his plane, which was known as Lolita Express. Zero, right? So it's, it's that level of bias that once somebody's exposed to understanding that level of bias, you lose your faith in the institution. And so, you know, is it too broad of a brush, Chris, to say journalism is, is destroyed and I can't trust journalists? Absolutely. Any journalist working for a major media outlet, I do not trust. I don't trust any of them at this point because, again, of the sins of commission, which is the, the high school student thing we're talking about, or that omission Really? Not one mention of Bill Clinton taking 26 trips on the Lolita Express while you were inflamed over something that, that uh, Trump had done says there's, there's a disequal standard here, which means it's not objective, which means it's not journalism. It's opinion. It's narrative crafting opinion stuff, right? Which is fine, but you got to understand that's what you're consuming, right? Somebody says it's a banana, but it's actually a stick. You know, there's a difference, you know, <laughs> you just should know what you're eating, you know, it, it's just, so that's what just bothers me the most is somebody who's aware, I pay attention. It's just so obviously fraudulent and fake and meaningless and leading us astray. It's just the obvious of it that, that, that bothers me sort of like, that's where my emotions come up. I'm like, you know, it's just, it's just, yeah. it's just ridiculous, you know? It's a ridiculous distraction, and everybody yeah. gets inflamed over it, and they become very emotional and very passionate, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, it's along the same lines of, you know, if we've lost faith in our mainstream media, mm -hmm. um, we're watching our justice system, Jesse Smollett. I mean, there's another indication of, do we have a justice system? Mm -hmm. Can someone just pick up the phone and make a phone call and no matter what someone's done, lied or whatever, have it just dropped and just gone to the infuriation of the Chicago police and, you know, everyone that 
spent a lot of time and money and resources in investigating the situation. So our country really needs to step back and take a look at, I think we need to get back to the truth. Well, we do. And, and Michelle, it's only a matter of time. You know, you see enough of the Jesse Smollett's and, and Hillary not being charged or, or Republicans getting away with stuff. I, I want to be fair and balanced. But when you watch the upper echelons getting away with what seems to be literally murder up to, like you know, like Bank of America had tens of thousands of robo signing cases, right, where they were fraudulently um, signing documents during the mortgage crisis. Hey, they paid a big fine. But that's not a fine. When you look at the box that exists on these on these financial documents, right below it is a federal statement with the title code that says, you know, forging this is, you know, runs afoul of X, Y, and Z laws. These were felonies that were committed. Not one person was criminally charged in that entire thing. And that's an easy case. Take a Mueller with a team, go in there, find the person sitting in some poor cubicle of Bank of America who actually, you know, signed the document and say, who told you to do that? That's a question, you know? Oh, here's my supervisor. Ask them some questions. And you go up the food chain as far as you can. You throw them in jail. Done. And you make sure that you get a good solid perp walk so all of their colleagues go, I don't want to be that guy, right? And that's how it works. But we haven't had that. And so it's only a hop, skip, and a jump before people start going, why should I follow the laws? You know, nobody is. else is following. This is why it's so important. The reality and the appearance of the law, they're shredding both right now and doing it for cheap political points, you know, and, and it's just, or who knows what else is going on. The Smollett case stinks to high heaven. I mean, it's pretty clear, you know, and the FBI could have gotten involved there too, because apparently there was a letter sent mm -hmm. to him, mm -hmm. probably by him that included a fake white powder, which is, which is, you know, if you go to the airport and try that, you watch how quickly and rightfully you get charged with a felony because whether it's true terrorism or you're simulating terrorism, they don't really distinguish. They call it a terroristic act. So I consider mailing white, you know, unknown powders with a, with a violent letter attached to it through the postal system to be probably a foul of three or four very serious felonies. Where did that go, right? So, again, the appearance, if not the reality of the law, they're both missing in, in cases like this. And this is just one. It's a recent example. But we can talk about dozens of cases going back through time. And this is really, I think, unfortunate. And, again, you take that kind of stuff plus a wealth gap. Next thing you know, you got yellow vests, right, and things like that. And so that's why I care so passionately about this because I don't want to live in a disintegrating society. And I especially don't want to live in one for stupid reasons, right, because the Federal Reserve doesn't want to be unpopular at the next cocktail party they go to with their rich friends so they keep the markets propped up or, or whatever the stories are. We need somebody who's got, who, who really is capable of providing real leadership at a time we need it very, very badly so that we can um, get back on course. Because I want to live in a prosperous, safe, stable, healthy future, right? That's the one I want, and that's why I care about this. I want to shift gears here just a little bit before we go, because there's something very interesting happening that I'd like you to explain. Um, it's going on behind the scenes in terms of our overall financial picture on a global scale, and that is Basel III. And it's changing the laws regarding uh, gold, and the process is being implemented throughout the world right now. Tell us about Basel III and how this is going to be impacting our future. Well, sure. It's, it's a pretty complex subject. I'll make it as simple as I can because uh, who wants to become a, a, you know, <laughs> an expert in banking regulation tweaks and wiggles and whatnot. But uh, so it, the, the Bank of International Settlements headquartered in Basel, uh, it, it's the banker's banker's bank, right? And so they set these larger rules for how banks are going to international banks are going to operate. And so it's really important. You know, banks are pretty simple creatures when you get right down to it. Um, they have assets and liabilities, and then they have to hold some capital against that balance sheet. And so Basel 1 and 2 and now 3 are all sort of wiggling with the, what's the right balance that we're going to keep here? Because you want your banks well capitalized. So if they get in trouble, that's where the funds come from. So Basel 3 does something brand new that, that's, that's uh, pretty interesting with respect to gold. I follow gold pretty co closely. So when you're looking at, at the capital of a, of a bank, it's, if it was all just dollar bills in a vault, like it'd be easy, we'd add it up, but it's more complex than that. And banks have a lot of like ridiculous things. So how would you, like a bank says, well, I have a derivative with another bank and they're upside down on their derivative quite a bit. We're up, you know, we're, we're up quite a bit. So we feel like that's an asset of ours. It's, it's a lot. Uh, how should we value that? And, you know, the, the Basel Corp would say, well, it's kind of risky. You don't, you know, they, they could 
they could default the counterparty risk. We don't know. So we're going to give a haircut to that. You can't count it as what they call the top tier of capital. Tier one is cash. It's government bonds, right? These are things that you're guaranteed. Like I know this is good as cash, right? So tier one is their top capital. Tier two is sort of this dodgy stuff. Tier three is this ridiculously dodgy stuff. That's how it had been structured. And before Basel III, gold was a tier three asset, meaning you can have it if you had a whole bunch in your vault, but you had to give it a big haircut when they're adding up this whole box of capital saying how much you got. So if you had like, just I'll make some numbers up. If you had tier three capital and it was given a 50% haircut, you could have a billion dollars of gold in the vault, but it only counted as 500 million towards your capital. So that's what the banks are trying to balance, right? And by moving gold, gold got bumped all the way to tier one as part of Basel III. So now when you want to know how much gold you have in reserve, you just look at today's market price and you multiply by how many ounces you got and that's that, right? So it counts now as tier one capital. Will that make a big move in terms of how much gold banks are willing to hold? Probably. How much? I don't know. But it's a big deal to consider gold um, as money, as money itself within the banking system. So whether or not, you know, that rule change creates a lot of new demand for gold from banks, I don't know. Under the covers though, I'm pretty intrigued that the banks are saying gold is more like money than, than we were admitting last week, you know? So the moneyness of gold has just increased within the banking community, which of course has all the power in this story because they're the ones who make all the money, right? He who has the gold makes the rules. Well, it's really the printing press, you know, that's the one who makes the rules in this story. So I found that pretty interesting. That goes into, you know, this is being recorded. Let me, uh, where are we? March 27th, uh, end of this month, end of March. Uh, that's when those Basel three rules come into effect. So we'll see what's, what happens with that. But that's one of the larger changes for how gold is treated in the banking system in the past 30 years. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. And, you know, we're hearing that President Trump is bringing back the gold standard to back the United States dollar. So this is very really? interesting. I hadn't heard that. What's that about? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, Robert David Steele did an interview with him and he said that he expects by 2020 that President Trump is bringing back a gold backed dollar, which would be extraordinary because what we're watching right now with the Basel III, gold coming into the picture, so it may not just be the United States, it may be the entire world, we don't know, it's just, it's shifting, which would change things enormously as far as being able to print money. To an extent, so uh, I, I think I'm sort of a fan of Jim Rickards thinking in this regard where he says, well, if you have enough gold, like, like it doesn't matter if gold, it doesn't actually matter how many ounces there are. It depends what you value it at. So if you said, look, we have too much debt in the system and all this stuff. And, and so we have to sort of do a reset on this one way. A mechanism he talks about is, and just to pick a number, you might say, well, gold is now worth 10,000 an ounce right? So you've instantly devalued currency by a huge amount relative to gold. You valued gold really highly. And this has an important resetting mechanism for um, how much wealth is in the system and how you, how you can begin to account for the debts in the system. So we're, we're, we're way too far into the debt story and the liability story. There's no way this stuff is ever going to be paid back. You know, when I was at um, a conference with John Malden recently and, uh, and somebody said, oh, are you worried about social security? He's like, no. I'm not worried about it at all. It's not going to be paid back. So there's nothing to worry about, right? That, that once you get this far into that story of unpayable debts, the only question to ask and answer is who's going to eat the losses, right? And to that extent, you always know the bankers are trying to say, not us, right? You know, <laughs> not, you know they'd like it to be the taxpayers. So that's why you have to watch things like these rule changes and where's gold going and all of that, because I think gold has a big role to play in that resetting mechanism. I don't know what yet. They're going to try a lot of different things, but um, the, 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 the thing that to be aware of is that somebody's going to have to eat the losses, you know, and, and of course, it, it could be the fireman from Peoria, Illinois, who gets half the pension they thought, or their currency is worth half as much, but they get their full pension. One way or the other, they're not going to get paid all their money because they don't have the power in the story. So I'm pretty sure the pensioners are the ones eating it. But again, too much debt, too many liabilities. And the governments don't want to eat the losses. The banks don't want to eat the losses. Of course, that leaves option three. And uh, off we go. So that's why I want to, uh, wh whatever they're doing, I'm going to do. So I'm going to hold some gold here <laughs> and, and uh, hope they don't make it illegal uh, because terrorism or something, you know, uh, <laughs> right? 
and uh, and hope that that will provide me some some uh, chance of surviving what's going to be one of the largest financial crashes in all of history as this monetary experiment, this third and most ill-advised credit bubble comes to a, a screeching halt at some point. You know, whether that starts tonight at 930 or it's in nine years, I don't know. But sooner or later, uh, this comes, this, this credit bubble breaks just like the rest of them. And that's why I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a little intrigued by the Basel III uh, changes that have happened. Very interesting. Talk to us about this third bubble a little bit. Oh, the everything bubble? Yeah, My yeah. favorite topic. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the long sweep of this is 1994, there was this little hiccup in the corporate bond market, and Alan Greenspan freaked out. He's not the maestro. The guy was an idiot. Certified, cl- I mean, he mumbled. People projected onto him what they want. They're like, I didn't understand that, so it must have been smart. No, it might have been. It's just gibberish, right? Uh, so the gibberish king, as I like to call him, he came up with this idea of, of um, really just throwing huge amounts of new reserves into the banking system by eliminating the reserve ratio that they had to hold. We still technically have a 10% fractional reserve banking system. He made it go to zero through a, this funky rule change. That gave us this blow-off credit bubble in the 90s uh, on through 2000. That burst, that was painful. That should have been like, oh, <laughs> Let's not try and defeat the business cycle. Let's let those run. Those are less painful than this credit cycle. But no, they got Bernanke in there. And he's like, no, I can do better. He doubled them. Uh, gave us 1% blowout rates. Got a housing bubble. That burst. And then threw Bernanke into Yellen. We went to 0%. Uh, rates never seen in 5,000 years of human history with money. Uh, and the lowest ever, right? And that gave us the everything bubble, stocks, bonds, real estate, everything, high-end art, trophy properties, Gulfstream 650s, yachts, all the places where the money went, we saw lots of inflation. So anybody says, oh, we haven't seen inflation. The Fed tells me there's low inflation. It's like, you didn't track where the money went. Wherever you put the money is where you get the inflation. Try buying a penthouse property in New York, uh, a fine Gauguin, or uh, see how long the wait list is for uh, the latest... Uh, uh, Gulfstream 650 line. It's pretty long, right? So, so you know, the, we've had huge inflation, but this time, this is the everything bubble. Nowhere to hide. Even in 2007, there were places you could hide. There were still high-yielding uh, dividend stocks out there. There were markets that, that made sense still, even though that was a pretty ripping bubble. This time, there's nowhere to go. We have just, this is the everything bubble, including every country on the planet. So, when this bursts, Lots and lots of pain coming. That's the fun part about credit bubbles. Wee, big party on the way up. Oh, what a hangover on the way down. Uh, easy come, super fast, super hard go. Uh, they just, they, it's like lights out when credit bubbles burst. Um, you know, last Tuesday was fine. This Tuesday's awful, right? It's that kind of stuff. So um, that's what I'm expecting to have happen. That's what they've been fighting tooth and nail. Honestly, it began to break in 2016. They said, ah, they were too scared of it. They threw another $4 trillion into the markets uh, over the next year in order to, uh, you know, correct that correction. And here we are. And they're going to have to do more and more and more. But sooner or later, you can't do enough. It breaks. And people need to be ready for that. It's going to be really, like if 2000 was a bummer and 2008 was scary, you're really going to hate when this next one bursts, right? Because it's going to be some multiple of that. And uh, that's, that's the model we see coming. Again, didn't have to be this way. Warning shot across the bow in 2000. We got a, our, our hull was punctured at the waterline in 2008. And uh, those should have been the wake up calls for us that we were in uh, dangerous waters and, and uh, turned around. But here we are. And we're sinking fast. Talk to us about what you foresee. What's the picture? Um, I know you expect to have this happen quickly when it does. I know that you can't predict specifically when it's going to be. But what's it going to look like? Well, just take 2008 and multiply it by some number, right? So, you know, probably twice the uh, unemployment, a lot of pain, a lot of misery. Uh, there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies. The thing about credit bubbles is uh, during business cycles, you, some dumb stuff happens at the end of business cycles. Things that shouldn't happen, happen, right? You know, businesses expand more than they should and they do dumb stuff. But credit bubbles really just make that a lot worse. Uh, so this capital that was really thrown around has been hopelessly betrayed um, in the uh, words of John Stuart Mill, the economist from the 1800s, right? So in a credit bubble, dumb things happen, right? So about a half a trillion dollars got thrown into the U.S. shale oil space. I'm not, the oil that comes out of it, it's actually oil, it's got value, but they've lost money every single year they've been in operation. And it's a huge, gigantic pile of missing money. And that's just one industry in one place 
I got dozens, right, where we say this was just dumb. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have happened, right? Uh, to the people who are buying what looks like a crack shack in Vancouver for a million and a half bucks, so sorry, you're not getting that money back when this bubble bursts, right? Um, so those are the examples of sort of dumb things that happen, and there's no way to ever reclaim that back because the definition of a bubble very simply is when asset prices rise beyond what incomes can sustain. Good luck renting that crack shack in Vancouver out for anything close to the monthly nut you would need to make uh, you know, the payments on that house. It will never cash flow. So that's what I mean. Incomes you know, can't keep up with the asset prices. So that's where we are. That's what the central banks have done. It was super stupid. Um, but when it breaks, you know, that's what people can expect. Uh, it's going to be very uh, chaotic, very unpleasant. You know, our view at Peak Prosperity is people need to be ready for that emotionally, build your capital, have dry powder, understand what you would want to own because there will be better prices coming, but you need the emotional fortitude to be able to buy when nobody else is buying. It's going to be very hard to do. Uh, and so that's why people need to be I, it's psychologically ready for this more than anything. Say someone's ready with cash. Are prices going to be higher or lower for, for high-end properties? Uh, if, well, two words here, should and will, what should happen is prices are going to have to come back down. Will that happen? Uh, the F central banks are fighting that with everything they've possibly got at this point in time. So, uh, you know, I can't predict when it's going to happen. You know, the only way you can possibly justify this story, remember bubbles, assets, and incomes. The only way for this to fix is for the incomes to come up a lot. That's what they're trying to create. That's why they care about inflation such as they do. They want higher inflation because theoretically what they really want is they want wage inflation because then you can start to make, you can justify the asset prices by, you know, in, wages coming back up. So the incomes can begin to sustain that. But wages and incomes haven't been, haven't budged in like a decade, right? It's, it's like, there's no more, there's, it's hard to make a good argument for how that's going to suddenly happen, right? So that doesn't occur. And the asset prices just keep going higher and higher and they're desperately afraid of having the asset prices come down because it used to be the asset prices were a claim on the underlying economy. They were a measure of it. They were a marker of it. The stock market would go up in anticipation of either uh, you know, increase in economic activity or the reverse. But now they're kind of tied to each other. The, the market is the economy and vice versa. They've, they've gotten, they've gotten uh, commingled in, in uh, some unfortunate ways. So, um, uh, that's really what they're trying to defend is, is they can't have anything go backwards because it's really either upwards or it's a collapse. That's the fear. And so that's why, I, listen, maybe things can go up forever. I'm not a believer in that, but I'll hold out some small chance that that is possibility. I don't think infinite growth on a finite planet is possible. But assuming it is, people need to be ready for the idea that the central banks are not geniuses, they're not gods and goddesses, they're human beings. Many of them with painfully limited real world experience, they come out of ivory towers, they sound smart, but they have no experience in this stuff. So if they get it right and everything just grows forever, hey, we're okay. But if they get it wrong and they mess up, what happens is uh, we go into a collapse mode. And I'm a betting man, and I'm, I, I like to think, I like to hedge this bet. I don't have all my chips on the they're going to get it right part of the story, right? That's, <laughs> to me, that's like betting on roulette. You're betting on that one green slot, you know? <laughs> Not a good bet. <laughs> Chris, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Tell everyone how they can follow your work. That would be at peakprosperity.com, and we have a lot of free information there. We have a subscription side of the service as well for people who like to go a little deeper and understand the implications of all this. And uh, at, you know, at Twitter as well, at peakprosperity.com, the handle is at Chris Martinson. Uh, you can follow us there, but otherwise, just come by the website, check us out. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It has been my pleasure. Dr. Chris Martinson of PeakProsperity.com, whose incredible insights and predictions are covered in our free report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Chris. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 
This has been an incredible 2019 for Portfolio Wealth Global's channel and newsletter as well. We've profiled four stocks that are trading at all-time highs, have interviewed Robert David Steele, Cynthia McKinney, Mark Faber, David Stockman, and more, and released five top-tier reports that you must read. Go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash enemy, forward slash fed, forward slash ratio, forward slash Trump, and forward slash bear. Thanks for tuning in.